There are many ways daily around here where we can feel shame from a number of different angles. Yesterday for me, I was not expecting this. It arrived about mid-afternoon, I would say, after we had <laughs> left here. Those essays that some of us are writing for the show are difficult to write. They take a long time to do. And I was sort of trying to set up the entire week of this is going to be a lot of Aaron Rodgers news that's headed our way. A lot of people are going to be talking about Aaron Rodgers. And so I did something about player empowerment and quarterbacks in that sport, Tom Brady, Deshaun Watson, and the idea that the needle has moved a little bit on quarterbacks are feeling free in that sport, a conservative sport, a militaristic sport, a sport that we've talked about, the pressure of the culture. You got to be about the team. The quarterbacks do not do the stuff that Aaron Rodgers just did, that Tom Brady changed championship teams. They are the team, though, those guys. Understood, but uh, it wasn't something that you'd see before that a quarterback in that league, that conservative league, that conservative system throws away the relationship that he has with that city by daring to go somewhere else. And so I wrote something about the possibility of him retiring and then thought to myself, man, there are some people listening to this in the modern age who are listening to me talking about him possibly retiring after it's already been reported that he is indeed coming back <laughs> and that the Packers have made concessions. And I'm talking about player empowerment and the idea of Aaron Rodgers can force his way out by retiring. And all it took, according to Trey Wingo was, Hey, can you get me Randall Cobb? <laughs> it's like it's my favorite. It's like, wait a minute. Oh, what? Comes what? Back to Cobb, it's like, it's this was all about Randall Cobb. The MVP of the league, all he can do when he's like, like squeezes the, so, the, the organization. It's the worst power play I've seen outside of Stu Gatz. Brady gets Gronk and Antonio Brown, and Aaron Rodgers is like, please, I need Randall Cobb. Randall Cobb. I thought when Trey Wingo reported that, I was like, that's got to be wrong. That can't be the concession that the Packers have to make. It's not, never mind all those stats about Peyton Manning has thrown 293 career touchdown passes to first round picks and Aaron Rodgers has thrown one. It's just about, can you get me Randall Cobb? And no, you can't get me Jordy Nelson. Okay, I'll settle for Randall Cobb. <laughs> it's like, what is that? What? I thought Cobb had retired. <laughs> I gotta be honest. He was ineffective last year. He might as well have been retired. I think he was uh, injured. And I also think I know he's in Texas. I feel I feel strongly that he's in the state of Texas. Yeah. You're not sure whether he's a cowboy or not? Gee, it's, it's, it's either Houston or Dallas. Yeah, I think he's uh, a cowboy. No, it's Houston. It was it Dallas was before that. Yeah. It's either Dallas or Houston. I, I knew it was one of them. So Mike had it right more generally. So what did you make of what it is that happened yesterday? With with Aaron? I mean, no, no, Greg. <laughs> no, with Greg. Cobb. Well, we're no, talking Greg. about Cobb. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I was talking about the you, uh, you women's air a, rifle. From a Cobb perspective. I just wanted you, I wanted to know what you thought about France's four gold medals. Right. I just took a weird route to get to right. it. Right. It's about time in the Philippines, by the way, won their first gold in 97 years, which is fabulous. Um, I, it, it doesn't surprise me. I didn't think he was going to retire. Uh, I wasn't sure they were going to trade him. It, it doesn't. This is a perfect compromise. It works for both sides. One year, and then he's out of there. So it works. It's uh, perfect. We think he's out of there, right? They're still working on the contract details, but he has to make sure, like Dan, if he went through all of this to get Randall Cobb and doesn't have some sort of agreement in place contractually that allows him to leave next year right. and go where he wants to go, terrible. Well, the reported details are it, it does kind of seem like he'll be able to go at the end of this season. Kind of. Right. Yes. Billy, what are you hypothesizing that the Packers should do? As lie a to him. They should absolutely <laughs> lie to him. Yeah. Tell him whatever he wants to hear to get him back. Oh, yeah, don't worry here and trust us. Yeah, you, you want to leave after this year? Yeah, no problem, buddy. You can go wherever you want. Don't worry about it. Just trust us. We'll take care of you. Everything's good here. And then as soon as he gets back, you do none of those things that you promised him to get him there. <laughs> business dan do we now know what he and Devonte adams meant by posting 
the Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Is he saying Clearly last dance? Randall Cobb. Last dance. <laughs> no, no, I think he means get me Randall Cobb. In the middle, there's just a little corn <laughs> emoji. <laughs> Randall Cobb? I, Trey, it has to be true because Trey Wingo wouldn't put himself out. What did we stop at Eddie Lacy? We couldn't get James Starks. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows, but it worked. It and we work. can't <laughs> argue that. Can you get me Bubba Franks? I need Ty Montgomery because he wears 88 and is eligible for both backfield and wideout. It can't just be that, though. It has to be and the promise of this is the deal Brady had the last year with the Patriots, is it not? It was it was understood that in, in Brady's mind, this is the last year I'm doing this, but that was a more formal free agency he he was looking forward to his contract being well, up. he set it up that way so he would right. be a true free but agent aaron yeah. Rodgers has to trust that the organization in a year the organization will say if they don't make the super bowl or if they don't win the super bowl well does he have to trust that or can he get it in writing right, can he course. get it guaranteed he's, he's got has, no trust he doesn't trust the packers i don't know if you can get something like that in writing this uh this is a power play that failed by aaron Rodgers. he Thought he kind of, he felt good about assurances that he got pre-draft, didn't work out. Then he started leaking stuff out to the media before the draft, showed his hand, and his other hand that he had to play was, then I'll just straight up retire. And obviously he wasn't going to do that. $50,000 a day, you are fined. The NFLPA agreed to this somehow. $50,000 a day for every day of camp you willingly do not attend. And that was ultimately what got Aaron Rodgers back in there with assurances that, hey, I can go wherever I want. And then probably a Packers organization that's like giving him a wink and a point, hoping that if we win the Super Bowl, we dare you to go anywhere else. That's the way I would do it, a wink and a point. But I heard Schefter saying this morning um, that they are working on the details and that Aaron Rodgers is not going to step foot on a field until he has that guarantee and assurance for the Packers. Right. There's so. just no way he would trust them. There's no way he goes forward. He? Without getting this in, in writing contractually. I don't believe, Mike, that $50,000 a day is enough to get Aaron Rodgers into camp. Just that. It has to be not just that and Randall Cobb. It has to be something right. else. But what about day four of yeah. this? Because I'm going to feel like maybe the room starts shrinking a little bit and you start feeling that a, a little. A it's a car. lot. It's a yeah. lot of money. It's a luxury car he's given up a day. I mean, he's married now, Dan. Bills are stacking up. We know that he's out here on auto pay with country clubs. He needs to tighten up those finances. I'm pretty sure that in holdout situations, I think I have this right, they can retroactively go back and give you back all of that money. I don't think that the fines are a permanent thing, that once you arrive at a place that – yeah. You are. It could be negotiated. You've agreed to terms. They wipe out some of uh, the court costs or whatever it is. <laughs> the, yeah, it would have to be negotiated, but they they absolutely can go back retroactively. Also, they they could not. I, I it seems as though the Packers won this round, and we'll see. And they'll probably end up winning the whole thing because Aaron Rodgers is going to be their quarterback. He's a, he's an elite quarterback. They get another year of what we think is Aaron Rodgers being good, and then he gets a year older. A little bit more wear and tear on that body. And then they'll be like, okay, you can go wherever you want. It'd be interesting to see if it's an AFC or NFC, if, if the Packers have any say in that, or if this is just, hey, let's make it go away this year and let you go wherever you want next How year. How much would you pay to know the real details or to see what the negotiations look like with agents and lawyers and everyone else, given that there are relationships here. There are people that he knows. There are... What, whatever's happening in terms of arguments and uh, dislike and distrust, there have to be things here that are negotiated. You think, we all think, correct, what's been reported so far, that he's going to be allowed to leave at the end of this year. That it's not just Randall Cobb, and it's not just get to camp and no fining. I know, Randall it's funny. Cobb. You can't. Right. You, you right. have to just, laugh every time be. you hear yeah. the name Randall right. Cobb. You have to laugh. Right. Yeah, I, I don't. How do you even? How do you even hold out against Green Bay? This is the worst organization. To hold, they don't have an owner. Like, who do I complain to? We have to have a town hall every time I want to have a holdout. Who, yeah, file your complaints. Uh, some guy named Murph. I don't understand how you win against the Green Bay Packers. They just smoked our Aaron Rodgers. 
how is this being perceived nationally? Because Mike's saying this is a loss for Aaron Rodgers, and I keep hearing people say some of what Greg Cody is saying, which is win-win. I don't think Randall Cobb is win-win. I think he gets to leave at the end of the year with a, by mutual agreement might be win-win. No, but both sides do win. The Packers get Aaron Rodgers for one more year. Rodgers gets to try to win a championship with his teammates for that town for one more year, and then he gets to go, presumably, where he wants to go. That's a win for everyone, I think. Right. I don't think Aaron Rodgers truly was ready to retire. So he gets potentially one more year and then he can do what Brady do, which is enter free agency as long as the Packers agree to his, you know, concessions and whatever, which like Greg said, got to get that in writing. But it's not yeah. free agency. And I don't think you can put something right, like that in writing. Right. It's not free agency. But with the understanding that if he's still unhappy, they'll be open to trading him. And if they don't, and then at that point, I think we either have this whole conversation again and he's unhappy and he tries to force their hand or potentially almost retire again. And I don't see the Packers like I don't see him blinking if this happens a second time. They're taking that third year off of the contract and they're removing any tags that they could potentially put on him. So that's going to make him a true free agent. I mean, it is. That's but what that's Brady a, did. But that's in two years. That's in, a true free he's agent in two years. And he's trying to get that. He's trying to say, hey, after next year, we're done. No tags, no more contract. Get rid of it. I don't care. I just want to go somewhere else. I suppose else. that that's the way you get it in writing. You have, after one year, a contract option that allows Aaron Rodgers to get out to void the contract. But I also think Aaron Rodgers would like those $45 million a year. Well, he'll get them somewhere else, right? Depending on how he plays. What if he gets hurt? point he's also getting the chance to like he's giving the Packers a second chance basically saying like look you guys almost screwed this up now you have a season to give me some of the things that I want and if I'm not happy then I'm leaving like this is the last chance <laughs> I don't it's kind of like being in a relationship and it's like you got <laughs> you like you keep cheating on me I'm giving you one more chance and if you do it one more time I'm out of here and here's the bracelet i.e. Randall Cobb. I, who leaked this out to Trey Wingo? Was it Randall Cobb's agent? Was it, the, it had to have been the Texans or whatever team in Texas he plays for. Because there's a who chance. Who does it benefit, Mike? <laughs> Randall Cobb, the organization Randall Cobb plays for, obviously, because he's probably, he's up there in age. He's probably someone that might he's get cut. 30. He's 30. Yeah, but he's, he's 30. not the he's same 30. player. He's 30. Get out of yeah. here. To defend Randall Cobb a little bit, he did have an 800-yard season two years ago before he was traded to Houston and, and was injured. So I don't know. It's like Randall Cobb is a, a funny butt of a joke, but he's not like the worst he's player number three. in the NFL. 30? Okay, whatever it is that he is, he's Randall Cobb. I'm, I'm going to disagree. <laughs> I think he is funny, and I do think he's a punchline. And the only way it would have been funnier if it was Jared Abaderis. Do me the favor of... Just looking, Mike, at all the memes and gifs that came after Trey Wingo's report that I'm hearing that the concession that Aaron Rodgers needs is Randall Cobb. I just want you to tell me how many how many cats there are just looking befuddled and confused. I want to know what is after that because there have to be nothing but confused jokes after the Trey Wingo report that the thing that after all that, after all that mess, the thing that's getting him back to camp is the promise or the possibility. That's not even the promise because Randall Cobb is still on a team in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people that had to read it several times over. I thought this tweet was from 2017 <laughs> when it first came across my timeline. BJ Raji has to be super jealous right now, right? <laughs> You've run out of skill, guys. You run out of skill. Yeah, but BJ Rogers a good one. <laughs> I, I'm trying to find all the skill guys. Haha, -ha, Clinton Dix. <laughs> John Coon. Maybe he's purposely making a ridiculous demand and trying to test them. Like, you guys really want to give me something? How about Randall Cobb? It's Let's see how far it's, you're it's willing to go. Performance right. art. I, I believe. There's a, there's a Donald Lee, I believe. There's a Corliss. There's a Corliss. I know there's a Corliss. I love the idea of John Coon. You got to get me a fullback. Yeah, I got to get the fullback. <laughs> the one. Didn't this whole thing start because of Jake Kumaro, too? Can we get Jake Kumaro yes. back? Yes, it yeah. did. Reacquire him from the Bills. <laughs> TJ Lang. Cobb. The Colonel. 
It's not his nickname, Greg. It should be. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Actually, Randall Tex Cobb, considering his weird knack of playing <laughs> te- <laughs> for teams in the <laughs> state of Texas, <laughs> yeah. he Randall Tex Cobb at this point. <laughs> The Colonel. Damn right. Who is Corliss? Number 80, I think. I got to find him. Andrew Corliss. <laughs> that's the guy. Yeah. Geronimo oh. Allison. Oh, that's a oh, great wow. one. That is a good one. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good one. It's a funny name. Who was fat number 80? Mm, oh gosh, I'm gonna get this guy. I'm like a dog with bone on this one. It's not Abadaris. There was another. There was another white dude who caught the hail mary. Was it Abadaris or somebody else? The hail mary against Arizona. Abadaris. I don't think you're gonna do better comedically as a name than Abadaris. Hail mary, Arizona. A legendary play. Jeff Janis. Jeff Janis. Oh, Jeff Janis. Wow. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when you hear it, you know. When you hear it, you Jeff know. Janice. Janice. What happened to him? He stopped playing for the Packers. <laughs> he was Jeff Janis. Yeah, he was Jeff Janis. And that's how they helped him out. Oh, yeah. Injuries? No, we won't be aggressive at the deadline. Here's Jeff Janis <laughs> and Justin Perillo. <laughs> was that fat number 80 might have been i think perillo was yeah. fat number 80 yeah, justin perillo <laughs> legitimately thought it was like a corn cob that's what I thought. Yeah. well it yes. works both ways wow this is just this is just arriving to you it's funny you didn't even yeah. yeah you didn't mean to go for the hominem the what how, how many grits is more like it oh yeah. my god thank you thank you Chuck it's like the word two, Dan. There's various uses of it. There's the number T W O, then there's T O, like if you're going to write a letter, and then there's T O O also. Thank you, Billy. That's what I'm here for. Who needs me? It's also <laughs> it's also what makes the American English language so difficult to learn, because homonyms don't really exist other places. Exactly. Is that right? English is the only language well, that has that? Well, I've spoken to I've spoken to people that have learned English as like a third language and they're like, "Man, homonyms. Woof. That was, that was it's, tough. It's unfair." Yeah. <laughs> How do you explain to somebody in a second language, "Look, here's the deal. There's then and then there's then, and they're spelled differently and they mean different things." Yeah. Right. And don't check Twitter because they still don't get it right. There's there and there, and then there's there with an apostrophe. There's your and your, and those are the same, but there's a funny little piece of punctuation in the middle of one of them. What? But and but. It's a good one, Stu Gatz. It is? B-U-T. That's it. Oh, and B-U-T-T. Marion Butts. (laughs) Oh, wow. Bork Butt. Forgot about it. Boston Butt. Jake Butts. Is it Jake Butts or Jake Butt? It's just a singular butt. butt. Sorry, that's my bad. That's all right. You were thinking I was thinking thinking four cheeks. (laughs) No ifs, ands, or buts. Yeah. Oh, God. No (laughs) ifs, ands, or buts. Correct. I like that. Jake Butt was a good tight end. I thought he'd be better. Injury. He was good. He was hard to stop in Michigan. He was. Injury in college, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. No, well, I think coming into the pros, I think he might still be a Bronco or he's trying to hold on to the last vestiges of his pro career. Speaking of butts. <laughs> don't do beach volleyball transition. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> Terrible what, transition. What I was going to do is pink running to the rescue yes. of the Norwegian handball team. Love Good it. Save, yeah. Because they have been fined for uniforms that they're wearing because they don't want to wear bikini bottoms and Pink has said that she will pay all of the fines. I think you have to say Pink. Her name has an exclamation point at the end of it. That's true. Jake Butt is a bear. Yeah. Bear Butt. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. And what are you sorry for? Bear's another one. B-A-R-E. B-E-A-R. 
we were talking about that. <laughs> Pink. 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 <laughs> When did she put the exclamation point on her name? Has it been since the beginning? You know, it was. I don't think it was from the beginning no, because remember, not. she got trotted out as an R and B act. Remember, and then uh, you remember this, right? No, but I just googled pink exclamation point, yeah. and it's just exclamation points in the color pink think, on Google Images. Was this when she was with LaFace Records, and then uh, she had most girls? Most girls want a man with the bang bang. I don't remember Pink adding the exclamation point. Was there an announcement? Was it just something that it's happened? A big press conference. Subtly. You don't remember? It was recently, it was a couple of years ago. Yeah. It might have been done for the internet. Because if you Google Pink, she's not the first thing that comes up. Mm. But if you Google Pink, she is. It's like panic at the disco. Oh, wait, no. Panic at the disco. Yeah. That's it. <gasps> panic at, at the, the disco. disco. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or like Kesha with dollar sign, like Ke dollar sign ha is how you say it. There was an actual press Not conference. There was <laughs> there was an actual <laughs> press conference. Pink went to a press conference and said, now you need to put an exclamation point on Yeah, my I name. think like BT and MTV had it like live. I think CBS News cut in. It was like a whole thing. I think this is like a Mandela effect thing. I think some people remember the exclamation point and some people don't alternate timeline situation happening linda perry really changed the career of pink no that's a, that's an interrogative <laughs> you, what did you just pink. do <laughs> you, that, was pink. Not a, that was not an exclamation point and it was not a question it was someone pink. getting scared while, while seeing it's an pink exclamation point it was. <laughs> exclamation point question mark pink <laughs> i think it's like pet ink you're having trouble with this, Jessica. <laughs> well, the P, the exclamation was after the P. Hell of a career for Linda so Perry. So it's pet and then ink. Ink. Linda Perry was the singer in Four Non Blondes. They had that one hit, which um, I think is parenthetically what's going on. A lot of people call it what's going on, but I think it's something else uh, that doesn't make sense. And everyone just says what's going on. The hey, yeah, 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 banger. <laughs> But she had this amazing <laughs> career as a songwriter. Thank you, Mike. I mean, that really yeah. explains. What's it. going on? <laughs> it, it felt like you were yawning before <laughs> that, like you were having trouble. <laughs> what, I can't. Uh, it's called What's Up. That's not a good name for it. So you can understand why. <laughs> Was there a big battle between the record label and Linda Perry? It needs to be called What's Going On. It's being called What's Up. <laughs> and then a request for Randall Cobb was made, and then eventually There's they land no on way that pe People are just calling. There, there are a lot of songs like that, right, that are called by the incorrect name. There's no way that that song is called by the majority of people What's Up. No way in hell. I think most people actually call it Hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, That's what jarred yeah. my memory. I said, hey. <laughs> what's good? Oh, what? Yeah, what's up does not <laughs> land. Can you imagine if at the end of that hey, hey, hey thing, it was just, what's up? <laughs> Is the phrase, what's up, even and in I the said, song? Hey, what's up? What's up? End of song. Greg Cody asks a good question. Will you find anywhere in the song the lyric, what's up? Yeah, cameo. No, that's word up. <laughs> that's all the two Americas thing. Right? Yeah, song. Yeah, song. <laughs> Wait, was that was that also word up with an exclamation point? Probably. It had to be. Word it had to be. Exclamation point. <laughs> yes, it is. Full circle. Or maybe song two by Blur. Obviously, song two is not on there. It's just woohoo. Woo Everybody knows that by woohoo. Yeah, classic. And no one knows the words to that song. You guys head shave. I, yeah, I still sing Vokun anytime I hear that song in the bar. You just go, Vokun! Oh, yeah, yeah. Anytime Vokun made a big save at the Panther game, they like, would do that. Vokun! Great contract that <laughs> it was. It was great. It was, was such a blast. Able, were you able to get that off the ground? Was oh, it was, it was massive. Vokun! And they would play the song, and people would lose their mind. And now what was really cool is the Panthers have sneaky, very... 
They have very few traditions. The 1996 Prince of Wales Trophy, <laughs> and then the fact that they scream red during the national anthem. But now that we have Spencer Knight, they also scream night during the anthem when that comes to, <laughs> up in the lyrics. That's it. Yeah, that, goosebumps. That's what passes for yeah. history around here. Yeah, rockets red <laughs> like pink <laughs> with an exclamation point. It's red with an exclamation point. There is no use of what's up in the song. What's up? Come on, that's is that crazy. right? They don't even say what's up. How can that be? I mean, what's going on? <laughs> we will get to Greg Cody's Back in My Day in a second. This is very exciting. A couple of consecutive weeks of hardworking Greg Cody <laughs> doing Back in My Days. We Correct. will also get to a couple of interesting Olympic stories, including Simone Biles, having some mental stuff going on because the Olympics are enormously pressurized. So we will get to a couple of interesting Olympic stories in a second, but we stop all to get to Chris Mad Dog Russo because he's being a mad dog about the Olympics, about Greg Popovich. This is Sirius XM Mad Dog Radio. We always stop everything around here when someone sends us some of the breathless, crazed, rage-filled sound. You know, uh, they, uh, they know, they do the human interest stories. Here's the Olympic uh, watch party and, you know, Arizona, in Orlando. Oh, God, enough, please, enough, enough. Uh, you know, I, I have had trouble. I mean, I, I know the, I know the opening ceremony rating was, they had 17 million watch it, which was, you know, basically 100% less than any other one that they had, you know, basically 50 million watch London. Uh, I, I know that, I don't know what the rating was on Saturday night. I like to, I like to find that, uh, but I'm having trouble so far. And then, you know, and then they, and then they're going to double down and they're going to start fooling around with this dopey peacock. And I screamed about this with the Federer French Open match. This is not the first time uh, when they put him on the freaking peacock. And I was looking for scores all day. It really annoyed me. If they're going to sit there and they're going to put a U.S. basketball game on a peacock because they think they're going to get Chris Russo or, or, or a blue-blooded ma uh, a blue -blooded male, or, you know, they're so desperate to watch it. I just watched a million NBA playoff games, including the final which ended five days ago. If I miss USA France, I'm going to live. And if you're going to make it difficult and you're going to make me work for it and pay for it to see it, I'm out of there. I'm not, I'm not that into it. And then you give me a coach who's a sourpuss every time I turn around. I almost root against him. I'm out. <laughs> I mean, Popovich is such a grouch. I know sometimes it's endearing because you like him, but you know you can't ask him a question if you lose. If if they lose, you know you can, you know if you ask him something, he jumps down your back like you're a peon, and he's the king of all coaches. I mean, this is a team that's got Durant and uh, and Lillard. All right, they shouldn't be losing to Fournier, Fournier and Gobert. I'm sorry. And here comes Holiday, by the way, uh, who just won an NBA championship, who showed up. Now, this team should not be losing to this freaking team from France under any circumstances. And if you ask him about that after, the, you know, he got all upset after they lost in an exhibition game, he's yelling and screaming. He almost makes you want to root against the United States with his attitude. Oh, he's such a grouch, and he hates the media so much. Gee whiz. You know what? This is not little San Antonio, Texas, where you can intimidate everybody, and nobody's going to say anything in that small little southwestern Texas town. You know, this is, you know, you're supposed to be representing America here. You can't answer a couple of tough questions after a bad loss, and anybody who has the audacity to ask you a question is a, is a bird brain? Oh, come on. Cut it out. Gee whiz. I mean, my goodness gracious, it drove me nuts. I can't listen to him after these games. If you ask him anything that is that is looked at negatively, he just, what do you know about basketball? You don't know anything about it. Oh, shut up, Popovich, will you please? Shut up. I'll tell you one thing. I guarantee you, if I was picking sides outside for my life and I had a choice of Durant and Lillard compared to Fournay or Gobert, I know which way I'm going. I'm going Durant and Lillard. I know which way I, I got a game to 11, and if I don't win it, I'm out for a month, and I don't get a chance to play. I'm picking Durant and Lillard. I'll let Gobert rebound, and if Fournay can make a shot, fine enough. I'll take these two, and I'm not going to lose. He did. <laughs> it's not surprising on, that he wow. would not be pronouncing Fournier correctly. Also, a couple of G whizzes in there yep. and a bird brain. Yep. And, and it cut it out. I mean, it's a staple of uh, Christopher Mad Dog. Where is it? And so God slits not gloss over the fact that he thinks he's a better basketball coach than Greg Popovich. <laughs> time the peacock. Time now for Greg Cody's back in my day. 
And now, it is time to take a trip down memory lane. Here's your guy, Greg Cody, with Back in My Day. Weed. <laughs> yes. Man alive. Has the way that marijuana is consumed changed in my lifetime? I can't say it's the most drastic change I've experienced across adulthood. Bear in mind the first words I ever wrote for the Miami Herald were typed onto triplicate paper on a battleship gray royal manual typewriter that weighed 60 pounds. <laughs> but the evolution of pot is right up there, starting with the fact it was totally illegal back in the day, and now medical marijuana is blessed as legal in 33 states, and 11 of those states also allow its recreational use. I'd like to contrast one of my earliest experiences with pot to my most recent. After first noting, I went decades in between never using the stuff in case any of my Herald editors are listening. <laughs> Stay away from the evil weed, kids, or you might end up like Greg Cody. So it's around 1974, and Greg hops into his Buick Skylark, pops in an 8-track, cranks up Led Zepp, <laughs> and drives north to where he'd buy an ounce of pot in a plastic bag from a buddy in a clandestine exchange. The cost? 20 bucks. <laughs> Funny as I recall it, but my guy used to throw in a pack of rolling papers gratis. Talk about marketing. The weed was awful. Weak. You picked it as clean as you could, and still the odd sharp stem or two would poke through the rolling paper. After you lit up the stray, seeds would pop like a vinyl record. You had to smoke a joint the size of your middle finger to feel an appreciable buzz. <laughs> so, I did the recreational puff thing from very late teens until the dawn of parenthood, then didn't for a long, long time, until two summers ago. <laughs> Wife and I are summer vacaying in Colorado, where it's legal. And we must have taken a wrong turn because we somehow wind up in a marijuana dispensary. I walk in expecting the people working there to look like Jimmy Buffett or Cheech, Instead, they look like pharmacists, right down to the white lab coats with logos. Next thing I notice is you can't buy a joint there. I don't even see any purple bongs for sale. My eyes didn't get any farther than the array of edibles, gummies to brownies to lollipops. There were spray and cream and drop form pot, too, as well as the vaporized version. Just for totally legal fun, and at great cost, I might add, we buy a long plastic tube filled with about a dozen small, quarter-sized Oreo-looking cookies. They're pretty potent, the guy warns me. Apparently, I don't believe him. Back in the hotel room, I gobble two cookies. At the restaurant, I think we ordered 27 appetizers. <laughs> the medicinal <laughs> benefits of THC are well known by now, prescribed to relieve stress and anxiety and lessen the symptoms of lots of illnesses, including epilepsy, Alzheimer's, Crohn's, and more. Or maybe all you want to do is laugh way too loud, attack the snacks, and lapse into deep philosophical discussions you can't remember an hour later. I'm Greg Cody, and that's how it was back in my day. <laughs> We've always got a bunch of animal questions for Ron McGill. We do not run out around here, but I was surprised because Ron McGill is a decent human being. You rarely see anything in the realm of outrage from him, but he's also a basketball nerd. He was furious with Team USA for losing to France. You're disgusted. Look at you. You're just filled with disgust. Uh, you're going to hit us with a bunch of gee whizzes and, uh, and uh, bird brains and everything else because of how bad they Listen. were. What happened? Jesus Christmas, Dan. What happens is, you know, you have a team of NBA players that I think went in there thinking that they were untouchable. You know, the, riding the, the, the coattails of, of previous teams. Uh, they should have had a huge wake-up call when they lost to Nigeria, and then they lost right after that to Australia. Come on, guys. This is the NBA. And I understand that some of these teams have NBA players, but none of them have all NBA players. Um, this is the best team in the world, and I don't know if they're just, uh, you know, out there having fun and realizing, uh, forget that they are representing this country, but it's a huge tradition for me. I don't usually get that caught up in this type of thing, but this is USA basketball. For me, I always think of Jordan, Magic, Bird. You know, those are guys that, that set up a tradition that needs to be followed. It can't be three wake-up calls, though, Ron. Like, you can't – at, at no. that point, there's not a waking up. Like, you're not waking up. Well, you know, Dan, maybe it's a, a little uh, spotlight on the fact that maybe the NBA is not as much team team sport anymore as it is an individual sport. You know, a bunch of individuals looking at their next contract, thinking what's going to go on uh, for the next couple of years, how they are going to look as opposed to working as a team. Um, and that uh, maybe is what we're seeing in some of these guys. 
I was really, really disappointed in Durant. I, you know, the guy seemed like he couldn't throw it into the ocean from the pier. I love you, Ron. I hate your sports opinion. I love him. I mean, I want more. Ron, I'm wondering, does marijuana have any sort of positive benefits on animals? Yes, we do use CBD on several of the animals for several ailments. Um, so uh, we do know that it does have some benefits. You know, we don't have animals telling us, oh, my God, this makes me feel better. But we can see in the, the change of their gait, the change of their walk. They're, they've lost a limp. They're not favor, uh, favoring certain things. Uh, you know, certain biological processes take place that seem to indicate improvement through the use of CBD. Roy, what do you have for Ron McGill? Ron, I've read that falconry is 4,000 years old, and it's actually pretty prevalent in uh, Pennsylvania. They have oh, just about 300 uh, licenses for falconry. Uh, what exactly goes into that, and how does one get trained? Well, you usually have to intern under a master falconer, and they teach you how to work with these birds of prey, how to teach them how to hunt, how to get them. You know, this is a huge sport, not just here, but especially like in Europe or in Asia and in Arabia. I mean, they teach these eagles to hunt big animals like you know like huge uh there, there, there are eagles that take out foxes that take out goats um take out animals like that so um it, it is a very big sport you probably you can look up national geographic and talk about the golden eagle flyers of um gosh i think it's like siberia or something like that it's one of these a, a very unique ethnic tribe that trains golden eagles and there's a girl now who's like one of the top top trainers of these eagles, where they fly these eagles to get mountain goats. They get freaking mountain goats with eagles. So it's pretty amazing. What is the greatest? You've told us the story of the harpy eagle coming and grabbing a sloth. Um, what are yeah. some other things that you've seen a bird just carry off where you've been floored because of the size of the animal it's carrying off? Um, you know, the sloth has got to be the biggest that I've seen carry off. Uh, I've seen other birds of prey kill larger animals, you know, um, kill, like I said, goats, sheep, things like that, but they don't fly off with them. Now this crap that you'll see on the internet, there's so much of that stuff now where you see this, you know, eagle fly into a park and fly off with a baby. That's all garbage. Don't fall for all this internet stuff. It's just not true. People can do amazing things now with Photoshop and all kinds of digital manipulation with films, but please understand that all that crap you see with eagles flying off with like Volkswagens and crap is just that crap. Ron, kill them how? Claw them? Or are there some instances where they carry them and then drop them? No, no, that's not the case. They do. They kill them with their talons. Uh, the talons, they're like ratchets, Dan. When they close, all the strength in the world can't get them to open. They have tremendous power of closing. And what they usually do is they close around the neck or the back. They break the back. They break the spine. Um, therefore, kind of severing the nervous system that the animal can't breathe. The heart stops. Everything stops. It's over. Greg, what do you have for Ron McGill? Ron, a headline I read today, unvaccinated snow leopard at San Diego Zoo catches COVID. Um, is it common? Do, do zoos um, vaccinate? Should they? They, um, they are now. They are now. It's an experimental vaccine. It's not the same vaccine that people get. It's created uh, uh, by another company, but that company is now providing uh, free samples to several zoos. I, I, I believe we may be on a waiting list right now, but I know San Diego has started to vaccinate. Uh, Chicago is vaccinated. Several zoos in the countries are vaccinating animals that we know are susceptible to COVID, which would include all of the big cats, would include the uh, non-human primates. It would also include the mustelids, which are like the otters, the weasels, um, you know, the minks, things like that. Ron, you were talking about falcons picking up large animals. I had heard through the grapevine that back in the day in New York, they used to release hawks to go hunt down the rats on the street. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? I, you know, it's a bad idea if you're poisoning the rats. One of the biggest killers of birds of prey is, um, you know, poisoning through, through rodent, ro ro rodenticide it's called. Because what they do is a lot of people put out rat poison for these rats and then the rats come out in the street and they're easy prey for these birds of prey like cocks. They'll eat the rats and then they'll die from the poison that they ingest from eating the rat. So that's a big problem throughout the country. Um, if, it's, if you're not going to be putting out poison for the rats, it's a great idea. Uh, New York also uses... Uh, falcons, peregrine falcons, for instance, do a big job on controlling some of the pigeons. They they feed not on rats, but on pigeons. So that's why a lot of New Yorkers see these peregrine falcons around their apartment buildings taking out the pigeons. Wait, so that's real? Like New York just releases falcons to take care of some of these animals? Where do they do that? Like, is there a no, falcon? No, they, they, don't, don't, they don't necessarily release falcons to do that. They have 
master falconers come in and fly their falcons uh, to clear animals out. You know, uh, they use these falconers also at airports where you have, um, you know, a lot of birds that ca cause bird strikes with planes taking off and landing at runways. They'll use these falconers to actually clear the runways of, of these birds. Ron, what does it cost to become a master falconer? Because now I'm starting to get intrigued and thinking maybe, you know, if I have Sundays off or so, maybe I could dedicate a <laughs> Sunday a month and become a master falconer. Uh, no, it's going to take a lot more than a Sunday a month. It's a mm. huge commitment of a lot of time, and it takes uh, months, if not years, to attain that status. Um, it's something that really takes a lot of work, uh, Billy. It's not just a... Uh, you know, it's not playing Nintendo. Is there like a step down from Master Falcon, like Apprentice Falconer that could, yes, that could you get, can get with into like Falcon? You can start learning as an apprentice. Absolutely. All right, let's do it. Ron, what is the most <laughs> unusual animal, or I should say, what's the most surprised you've ever been to see that an animal has been receptive to training? Crocodiles. I mean, you know, you have an animal that basically you have a 12 foot crocodile that has a brain the size of a walnut. And yet, you know, we've been able to successfully train them here at the zoo to go from point A to point B, uh, to relocate them, to come up for a feeding response, um, you know, to go down into the pools that they need to go down into. You know, we're able to train these animals to do that. So it does indicate that they have some form of intelligence, though the size of their brain would indicate it's very limited. Ron, the city of Tampa smells more than it usually does, and that's because of this bad red tide. Now, red tide, I knew it would happen occasionally when I was growing up, but is this happening more often? Is this climate change or just me being made aware of it 600 more often? tons of dead fish on the shore. Yeah, no, this is, this is certainly happening more often, Mike. It's a, it's a combination of the, the warming of the water, which causes these big blooms of algae that then uh, lead to this red tide. Uh, that's compounded by a lot of the fertilizers and nutrients that are being fed into the waters uh, from, you know, a lot of the, the farming and, 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 and uh, you know, that type of, of industry where a lot of these nutrients and fertilizers go into the water that also cause these huge blooms. And that's what leads to a deprivation of the oxygen in the water and to the death of these fish. There's a lot going on with climate change, flooding over here, fires over there. What do you regard in, in the climate change sphere as the greatest of the threats to the animal kingdom? Um, you know, sea level rise is going to have a huge impact on a lot of environments. Uh, the loss of sea ice is going to have a big impact on a lot of the, you know, iconic species like polar bears and seals. Um, so I think that the, the water level changes are going to be the biggest, um, you know, results of climate change. You know, saltwater intrusion into the Everglades, into South Florida, uh, causing problems with our water supply. These are all things, you know, not just feeling uncomfortable getting hot and fires and drought, but these water level changes, whether it be the extreme drought or extreme floods, that sea level rise and that saltwater intrusion uh, destruction of habitat is going to be a, a, have a major influence on a lot of species. You're not a sea expert, but how problematic is the overfishing of the seas? Um, it's, it's certainly problematic, but as you said, I'm not an expert there. Um, it, it's not as problematic as climate change is going to be. I think the combination of the two could be, could be horrible. Um, but yes, we need, to, we need to be more sustainable in the way we, we are fishing our oceans. Ron, Animal Olympics, who wins the floor competition gymnastics? Jeez, <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Uh, floor competition, Animal Olympics. I would probably go with something like the Safaka. The Safaka is a fantastic uh, type of lemur primate that you should see the way it runs and dances and, and does things. It looks like it would do really well in a floor exercise. Look up Safaka there, uh, Stu Gatz. I think you'll enjoy watching. So, Faka, you're talking about, man. Oh, that's that. That was brilliant. That Thank was brilliant. You. For those of you who are not familiar with the Safaka, uh, from your childhood, you may remember a show <laughs> called Zabumafu. What? Yes, Zabumafu. Zabumafu was, in fact, a Safaka. I thought it was a lemur. Ah, Safaka is a type of lemur, but we're getting wow. more specific. He's so cute. I just want to like put a little hat on him. Ooh, you, yeah, should that's what, you know, Jessica, <laughs> you know, you bring you bring warmth to this show. You're Thank such you. a, a wonderful addition to this. I this want platform. to I want to do some more Olympic events. So let's do this. Uh, <laughs> the 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 200 meter sprint. Oh, wow. Oh, that's got to be a cheetah. 
I mean, okay. zero to four, zero to sixty in four seconds. I think Cheetah wins all sprinting events. Dan. Okay. How right. about the pool? How about the stuff in the pool? Stuff in the pool? I got to go with a sailfish. Sailfish is the mm. fastest fish uh, on Earth. 40, 40 to 42 miles per hour. Ron, if a frog is yellow, is there a good chance that that frog is poisonous? Um, all, all, all frogs tend to have toxins in their skin. The more vibrant the coloration on them, it tends to be more toxic. The, the more toxic the, the actual toxin is. So, so if it's a real vibrant yellow, yes, it, it probably is something that could be dangerous to humans. But if it's more of a real flat, dull yellow, not, not as dangerous. Generally speaking, the more vibrant and vivid the color, it's kind of a warning coloration, the more dangerous the frog could be. So you mean to tell me the kids of Gullah Gullah Island were just palling around with a poisonous Benya Benya polywog? Well, listen, understand that the toxins in a frog's skin cannot hurt you unless you put it in your mouth or unless you get it into an open wound. You can handle some of the most dangerous frogs in the world on your skin. It's not going to permeate your skin. Uh, that's not, it's not one of those things like touching poison ivy. Oh my God, you get all kinds of rashes and stuff. No, these toxins on, on the skins of frogs are not dangerous to you unless you get them into your mucous membranes or into an open wound. Is the cheetah also winning the endurance stuff? A marathon? No, the marathon? absolutely not. Good question, Dan. The cheetah would probably rank last when it comes to endurance. Cheetah can run for about 30 seconds and then needs almost an hour or two just to recover from that run. If you're talking about endurance, we're going to go with the African painted dog that can run for miles and miles and miles wow. at an incredible pace. And usually that's how it's, it's become the most successful large carnivore in Africa as far as killing its prey. How about the weightlifting events? Oh, that's got to go with an elephant. I mean, you know, you got an animal that can take a, a tree, a log that weighs a thousand pounds and lift it up like it's a toothpick. How about volleyball? Volleyball. That's interesting. Volleyball. Wow. Dolphins? Dolphins. I was going to say that. Yeah, I would, I would probably say dolphins, except you don't play volleyball in the water. If we're going to go with water volleyball, water yeah, I would go with dolphins. Dolphins. How about diving? Diving. Wow. You know, I would, I would have to, I would have to go with the, 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 um, the get, the gannet, the bird, the gannet, G A N N E T. Thank Look you. at them when they dive in pelicans too. Pelicans are great divers. Watch Pel the brown pelican. That's the only one that dies. But the brown pelican, the way it dives into the water, I, yeah, I'm going to go with the brown pelican for the diver. Ron, I was in Tulum over the weekend, and every once in a while, I would see a cougar crossing. And I'm not just talking about Howie, uh, happy hour at Bach. Um, <laughs> where is the single greatest example of metropolitan life assimilating uh, with the surrounding big cats? Is it in India? No, 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 no. Um, you know, I saw a leopard once cross a fairly busy street in the middle of Nairobi, Kenya. Um, so leopards are very ad adaptive to urban environments. Um, but you actually saw cougars crossing the street in Tulum? I mean, you saw, oh, you just saw a sign that said I cougar crossing. So many cougars <laughs> crossing the street in Tulum. You know, there's only one road. A lot of them with drinks in their hand. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Ron, animals can't own stores. That would be silly. But... <laughs> Are there examples of animals bartering in the wild? Yes. Yes, as a matter of fact. Um, chimps especially will usually bring things like fruit or plants or, you know, delicious foods. They will exchange them for different things. Uh, some chimps, particularly the bonobo, the pygmy chimpanzee, will actually use it to exchange for sexual favors. Come again? <laughs> yeah, you heard that right. They, chimps will sometimes, the bonobos, which are driven by sex. I mean, they're, the, they're considered the least violent primate society on earth. They solve everything with sex. Uh, and sometimes they will use things to barter for sex. And that's both female on female, male on male, uh, multiple orgies. They are the most sexual uh, of all the vertebrates on, uh, at least all the advanced vertebrates on the planet. They, uh, again, they don't fight. They solve everything with sex. Baby. But is there like inner animal uh, bartering or it's all amongst the same species? Um, you know, I know that under human care, animals will barter for things. You know, uh, we train uh, animals here. You know, if somebody throws a piece of trash on the exhibit, we can say to the elephant, okay, listen, I've got this carrot here for you. Throw me that piece of trash, I'll throw you the carrot. So 
that's training that way. But in the wild, I don't think that really happened. Not that it cannot happen. I just don't know of any instances where it has. Is that why the clothing store Bonobos is called Bonobos? The whole sex thing? Come on, do it that. could be. It could be because, like I said, Bonobos are the, the, the poster animal for sex. The javelin? Which animal is winning the javelin? Javelin. Wow. You know, jeez, uh, I, I don't know who would win the javelin. I don't know of an animal that actually throws like that, that, you know, that has a throwing. You stumped me on that. Humans? One, Dan. Gorilla? No. No gorilla? It, it could be humans. No, gorillas, yeah. gorillas don't throw overhand. Gorillas, like, they throw kind of wide or they throw underhand, but they don't. They don't chuck overhand like that. I feel like, None of the real primates do other than humans. I feel like the opposable thumb is crucial to the javelin throw. I, I would agree with that. But, you know, you can look at animals that don't have an opposable thumb that can still grip, you know, like the panda. The panda actually doesn't have an opposable thumb but can grip things like a hand because the center pad, it takes its – I don't know how to explain it, but it literally holds things like it's got, a, like it's got an opposable thumb when it holds its bamboo. So – you know, if a panda could throw overhand, it could throw a javelin because it would be able to hold it perfectly. Is the cheetah also winning the hurdles, or is that going no. to, to a no? Game? Oh no, 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 wow. no! They're not a huge jumper. They can leap forward, but they don't jump. Uh, the hurdles is going to be, I would say, the eland or any of the antelope. You know, like a springbok. Oh, springbok! That would be the perfect hurdle. Watch the springbok because it gets its name because of the way it springs. It's doing, 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 doing. Springbok would be a good hurdle. Ping pong. Ping pong. Mm -hmm. uh, I would go. Could you use more than one paddle? Well, no. I mean, Olympic rules. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> Double. Is, is that Billy telling me not to be ridiculous? Was that Billy saying that? Yeah. Okay. Um, ping pong. I would have to go. I would go with an octopus. Wow. That's why you asked multiple paddles. Now he's got. I did, but paddles. see, having, having, all, having all those all those arms flailing around would confuse the person on the other side. You see, mm. he, he wouldn't be able to concentrate yeah, where the paddle is, what he's trying to get him at. I think that would be very confusing to have this eight arms on the other side of the table, just kind of doing this all the time, not knowing which one's the paddle, but only the octopus really knows where the paddle is. So who wins the decathlon? Who is the greatest wow. athlete from among all of the animals? Greatest athlete amongst all of the animals. I would say, hmm, got to find something that swims well, of course. Um, rides a bike. <laughs> I've seen a bear and a tutu do that. So that's yeah. the triathlon. The decathlon is like all the track and field events. There, there is no animal that would be good at archery, correct? I've seen a bear. I, you'd be surprised. I think a bear could do this. You've seen a bear do what? I've seen. Right. Well, it's got two of the tries. All right. It's. A, I've seen a bear ride a bicycle, and I've seen a bear run. Right, but have you seen it with a bow and arrow? <laughs> I pick a monkey for the <laughs> archery. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be some kind of primate for the archery. I mean, I can't imagine anything else. You've got to have one hand holding the bow, one hand pulling the. Uh, the, whatever you call it, the string, the rope. Who's winning the long jump? Oh, kangaroo. Kangaroo, that, 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 that's a given. It's, it's 30 one. feet. Yeah. Not the flea? Yeah. And the triple jump. You know what? Hey, oh, wait a minute. I, okay. I, I bow to the flea. Yes. In relative size to the body, it's going to be the flea. I was not looking at invertebrates. I was looking at vertebrates. Um, but if we're going to go into the invertebrate... Uh, you know, realm no, but it's here, not by fleet, size. It's not, don't be ridiculous. It's not by size. It's just <laughs> overall distance. And a kangaroo is jumping further than a flea. It's not pound right, no, for pound. We're not doing this pound. Well, well, I, I, you know, I think Mike makes a very good point, though. Red I mean, hot chili peppers. Flea. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Oh. Oh. R Ron, where do you stand on uh, playing God and bringing extinct animals back to life? You know, I don't want to play God, but I'd love to bring back, you know, the dinosaurs are just a, a, a no brainer for me. I mean, I can't imagine what it would be like to look at a brontosaurus walking in an open field. I mean, that must be one of the most incredible things. When you look at the size of these animals, you look at their skeletons, how did they walk? I mean, how, how did they balance themselves? It must have been just an unbelievable sight. So I would be all for just bringing something like that back just to see what it looks like.
We did not do any photographs with you this week, but I want to tell the audience, last week he told the story, and you will see a write-up at World of Sui on a photograph that he <laughs> took of a gorilla that he thinks is uh, not terribly impressive as far as photographs go, but I believe people will want it because of the story behind it and what it means to Ron McGill. So go to worldofsui.com. You will see the photograph that we were talking about last week. And next week, we will do some more photographs with you that you've taken, Ron. Thank you for being on with us. Thanks, guys. Have a great week. Take care. Thank you, Ron. She can fall down during her routine, and the things she's doing are so difficult that she can still win because she's doing, th she's that much better than everyone else in these competitions where you're seeing people train for four years, and the difference between them and swimming Stugats is, is a hand being stretched, uh, is a longer finger. It's a tenth of a second. I mean, it's crazy. And she's that much better than everyone else that she could do a flawed routine and still win because she can do things no one has ever done. And now she's pulled out of the team competition at the Tokyo Olympics, according to a USA Gymnastics spokesman. And the statement is saying, quote, Simone is withdrawn from the team final competition due to a medical issue. She will be assessed daily to determine medical clearance for future competitions. But she has posted on her Instagram that she feels the weight of the world on her shoulders because how could she not? Right. And I ask you this, why is UM USA Gymnastics saying this is a medical issue? Are you questioning? It, it feels like they're trying to file it under injury when it might be mental health size of the moment pressure understandable pressure because she's the greatest to ever do this and she is a symbol she is a known name i we don't have a more famous olympian than her in this country do we like no. at, at the moment in the olympics we do not have an athlete when she says wait I mean, up kevin durant i mean wait okay yes fair right, enough the nba guy. among the amateurs thank you stugat sure uh fair enough simone biles is for Olympic competition in quote unquote amateurism, she's the biggest thing going for our country. I'd imagine that they want her or they're allowing her to control that message. Hey, you speak to it how you want to speak to it when you want to speak about it. That would be my best guess as to why they said it was an injury as opposed to, to mental illness. Now, Michelle Steele is out there covering it for ESPN and she just sent out a tweet where Simone Bri uh, Biles said, never felt like this before. Once I came out here, I was like, no, the mental's not there. I had to let the other girls do it. I mean, so she's going through some stuff, clearly. She's been through so much in the last year, just since last March when she found out that the, the, the Olympics was being postponed. She didn't know if she wanted to go through another year, another 12 months of training. Like, her body has been through so much because she is so good and she trains so hard that... She has spoken, and, and you should read um, Stephanie Abstein's profile about her in Sports Illustrated. She has spoken about how when you win four Olympic gold medals at the age of 19, it sh like she felt like it should be the pinnacle of her career. But after it happened, she was like, I was so focused on trying to make everyone else happy and satisfying everyone else that I, where do you go from here? Like she didn't know how to really process that moment. And so last year after the shutdown, she almost walked away from gymnastics because, you know, she's older than everyone else there. Gymna gymnastics is a sport where if you're 24, you're old. And she's called herself the grandma of the team. And she's talked a lot about how the pressure of the Olympics and coming back, especially the pressure of being part of USA Gymnastics, being the only Olympian on this team who is a abusive survivor of Larry Nasser, is something that she has to think about when she performs for this federation. Dan, they had a, uh, a morning workout, then a five and a half hour wait, and Biles said she was shaking while she was waiting to compete. Shaking. I don't think people can possibly understand. We work in sports, and all the time we're criticizing this person for not being tough enough and not having mental strength and not being able to overcome adversity and what a choker. I don't think people could possibly understand the strain of what it is these people do and the mental strength it requires to be specifically her in this situation, no matter how great 
she is. And so when that mental strength is weakened, when she doesn't feel herself, I believe that we are learning things about mental health that weren't spoken five years ago out loud around sports, that we are learning that these athletes are actually giving us their vulnerability, especially now at a time the internet is so damn cruel and all this stuff where we're so connected with the access to being able to tell these people through anonymity all these awful things. When she talks about the weight of the world, it probably does feel to her like this country's expectations are on her shoulders. And it's something that is so straining even through her mental strength that the greatest gymnast ever in this country, or I think any country, given that I've never seen anyone able to do anything close to what she does, is telling you that it's rattling at her confidence. And the U.S. team still won silver and... That's an incredible accomplishment. Uh, they lost to the Russians. The Russians are always neck and neck with the U.S. They're amazing gymnasts there also. And the ESPN push alert said that the U.S. Uh, women's team settled for silver. Ooh, I can't imagine what's waiting for her on social media, man. That's awful. Like, I just can't imagine because if she's there, they win the gold. She shouldn't have been there. She couldn't perform. She's feeling like she's not herself. She's dealing with some mental stuff and she withdrew, but I can't imagine what's waiting there on social media. It's got to be so surprising to her to have it arrive though at the moment of competition. We do not think of any of these people shaking with fear because of the pressure of the expectations and the demands for strength. And the demands of another year because the pushback of the, uh, of the right. Tokyo Olympics, it's the, the mental health minefield that you put yourself through to train for another year and being 24 years old, she's got a lot of life experience, a lot of mental trauma in just trying to get to that point. It's almost better if you're a teenager because you kind of don't know what you don't know and you're just going through it at that point. And when you have the life experience of being a 24 year old, you're able to identify things that are problematic, that'll make you less than a performer. And maybe the, I know you pointed out the medical designation, that the, uh, the gymnastics team put out there for it. Maybe that's their designation for someone going through something like that. And I'm, I'm certainly willing to listen to an argument uh, posing it as a medical issue because she's certainly not right. So so few Olympians are on that echelon where they could even relate. Uh, Michael Phelps is one, and he's also been very open about the, the mental pressures and, and, and the burden in that area. But can you imagine Simone Biles, the standard she set for herself? And, the onus on her. If you if you win two golds and two silvers, you're a failure to some people based on what you've done four years earlier. It's just extraordinary. And my wife and I were watching um, uh, the 400 meters uh, swimming the other night. And the difference between not just silver and gold, the difference between first place and eighth place over a long race is a couple of seconds over 400 meters. There's just so little margin of error. And Ledecky was crushed. I mean, she's won so many gold medals, and she was crushed to lose by three-tenths of a second yeah. to an Australian swimmer who has the world record. We are meeting this, obviously, with compassion around here. We have been talking about mental health for a while around here. I don't know that if we saw this in our American sports in this country, whether we would be this gentle with an athlete in this moment shaking and not wanting to perform. If Mike Evans says for five and a half hours before the Super Bowl, I wasn't right, I was shaking and decides not to play in that football game. Barrett Robbins missed a football game, got crushed in his own locker room for having a bipolar episode because of the strain of all of it. And that was not met. Now it was a long time ago and the attitudes have changed. But I don't know. You make it Suns and Bucks and make it Giannis. And I can't play in game six. I, I, I'm not, I can't. I, the, the weight of the world is on. You tell me. Are we meeting that? I, I think there'd be more compassion today than there was when, when it happened to Barrett Robbins. But to your, to your point, yeah, I think he gets crushed. Like, but I do think there are some people that are compassionate, right? I don't know. Yes, Dugat, there are some I mean, people that I don't are know, compassionate. Not many. I there mean, are no one in Milwaukee. That's there for are sure. some people right. that are compassionate. Yes. Also depends on the person because we saw with Kyrie Irving, who was kind of transparent about what was going on and just needing a little bit of a break. And we saw exactly how receptive the nation was to that. You can imagine, right? You can imagine. And I remember writing, look, 
when I don't know if this was the same Olympics because it was Carrie Strug with an injury and landing on a, an ankle, and it was an amazing athletic achievement. And it was a very moving Olympic moment. And I remember the press and the stretch, uh, the pressure around Nancy Kerrigan and the Tanya Harding thing and just marveling right at that amount of pressure landing on something like a bum ankle or landing on something as thin as a skate blade because of the precision that these things require and marveling at the strength that that stuff requires. And I remember writing about Bella Caroli and Carrie Strug, the idea of man, this feels a little bit cruel. The pressure that we're putting on in the specifics of gymnastics, young, young girls. And some people were mad at me for saying, well, why don't you treat them like everyone else? And I ask you now, how is this one going over? How is it being received if it is happening at the height of American sports. Do you believe that what you'd see on television and, and at the places where we are professional critics with voices that are loud and are constantly questioning mental toughness, do you believe we'd be gentle? I don't know what, the, I hope that Naomi Osaka and Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan and all the people who have led the way here on please pay attention to my frailty and treat it with care. I hope that that's what meets Simone Biles, but I don't know what's meeting her today. I don't know how disappointing it is to people who care deeply about gymnastics. And what do you mean our best athlete, our best ever couldn't do it? Because I'm listening to it and I'm looking at it and I'm saying, oh my God, what a suffering this must be for her to get with the pressure of all those sponsors, all those teammates to get out there and to not be able to do it when you're the best to just not be able to do it because because somewhere your mind has cracked like i feel that i'm like oh my god what how much that must hurt to train for that much time to be the best to have those expectations that pressure and to not not find the strength to meet it because it sounds impossibly hard i'd be overwhelmed by it now sure. you can imagine it right now you can imagine me trying it yeah. uh, but <laughs> I, I i like i i would totally cave i i i would wet my pants cave the earth because of your fat body <laughs> stuck the landing the news is breaking now that Texas and Oklahoma have told the SEC, hey, we're coming. We are on our way, and we're fortunate here at Metal Arc Media. Our CEO started the Longhorn Network, the SEC Network, the ACC Network, and so he could walk us through the business of some of what it is that's happening here. What's he doing with us? It is a little bit curious. John Skipper is with us. So tell us what it is that's happening here. This is just a money grab, right? We've just realized that greed at the highest end right now is Texas and Oklahoma are saying, never mind about the history and tradition or anything. We got to go over there in that conference where they're splitting up a bunch of money that we don't get to split up over here. Uh, well, that is essentially correct. It's long ago gone away that anybody cares about geography or even really cares about rivalries, right? I mean, when Texas A&M fled to the SEC, they left behind their greatest rivalry because they wanted to get at the SEC money. This is just about trying to stay at the top of college football. College football drives enormous amount of contributions from alums. It drives prestige. It drives admission. It's really what drives the media rights deals is college football. And right now, Texas, which has one of the great brands, even though, as uh, Jessica pointed out yesterday, it's been quite a while since they won anything. It's still arguably the biggest brand in football. It was a moment in time back in like 2010, 11, where Texas was at the center of all college football, right? They were responsible for holding the Big 12 together, or they could have gone to the Big 10, which was trying to get them, or they could have gone to the Pac-12, where there was a plan to create a Pac-16 and a super conference. And the Longhorn Network is what kept them in the Big 12 and kept the Big 12 together. And you built that Longhorn Network. I'm, I'm just sort of curious because you had this network 
that was bidding on the rights, but you also had a journalistic arm that was reporting on these details. I imagine when they're greasing the rails to leave, they're reaching out to a television partner. So you're hearing about it kind of first and you have to report on that. And that's kind of an interesting position that you're in. It is an interesting position, a potential conflict. You're dead on. And we handle it by keeping everybody except for me. Uh, the programming guys worried about trying to buy the rights. Uh, the business guys tried to worry about making sure we still made the money. And at that instance, we decided that, well, by the way, Texas had decided to do a network. We didn't give them the idea. But we knew that if we did the network, we could entice them to stay in the Big 12, keep them together. That was important to us. We already had a Pac-12 deal, but the Fox was ascendant in the Pac-12. And we didn't want to see Texas go to the Pac-12. Can you explain to us the dollars we're talking about here? Why is it you were explaining to us yesterday in the other room how many more millions are available here to Oklahoma and Texas now with this partnership than would be available to them otherwise? Well, ultimately, it's easily $20 million, $30 million, $40 million. The gap will keep getting bigger because of the SEC network which makes a lot of money because of the new ESPN deal for the CBS game, which they paid over $300 million for. I can almost do the math. If there were 15 teams, not 16, that's $20 million per team. Eventually, Texas will get into that money. $300 million for a game. The for Saturday a game. afternoon game. $300 right? million yes. dollars for one game. Compare that to where they were. Well, at one point, the let's see, the entire – television deal for the Pac-12 right now or the Big Ten is about $300 million. So that's for one game you're wow. talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's why this well, is happening, right? Yeah, that's the big 330 CBS game, which does as good a ratings as Thursday night NFL, right? They're doing seven, eight, nine. Yeah. yeah. And as absurd as it sounds like, it seems as though ESPN got a crazy good deal because now Texas and Oklahoma come to the network. Is there any chances this I, I TV doubt deal gets all, I doubt that all of that is unrelated. <laughs> I would not assume that this is just happening that one day the Texas and Oklahoma guys woke up. I would guess that it's a, a logical sequence of events that they're now the ESPN has all of the SEC. Now they bring Texas and Oklahoma in. Think of all the good games you get. Yeah. Just think about Oklahoma and Auburn and Texas and and, and the potential oh, postseason door right. that's been opened up with two separate conferences, a, a possible semifinal. $55 million is what CBS used to pay for that package, Dan. But they get the best of the SEC matchups, which is incredible when you consider the teams that we were just discussing. But the Big 12 is done, John. So does that, does that even matter in the grand scheme of things? Um, it certainly matters to Kansas State and right. Iowa State and those teams who now have to figure out what to do doesn't matter. I mean, there's tradition, but tradition's already been thrown away, right? Yes. So the Big 12 tradition is Frank Broyles and Darrell Royal and Texas, Arkansas. <laughs> that doesn't exist anymore, right? All exists now is, can I get to the top of the pyramid? The Big 10 is there. The SEC is there. The ACC and Pac-12 will try to keep up. The Big 12 feels like it'll be a scramble now for who can find a home where. And I think a lot of people think that the other conferences will also be scrambling now to try to consolidate either some of the Big 12 teams that are remaining or even AAC teams or a group of five teams that might make them a bigger super conference because it sounds like the way this is going is that in a few years there might just be four super conferences, which was like this whole thing that's been around, kind of floating around in the ether for a while for college football fans and Texas and Oklahoma kind of just started it kind of saw into the future a little bit. Well, there do, there is some logic to having four 16-team conferences. It adds up to 64. Uh, there's a lot of impediments to it still, right? You'd like to start with a white sheet of paper and take the top 64 teams, but you can't, right? You've got some teams that are in there that, that are odd fits. Uh, Rutgers. We have Rutgers, yeah. Rutgers clearly Rutgers, is an interesting fit. <laughs> Big Ten uh, would still tout the uh, the, um, the recruiting uh, yeah. pipeline that opened up there. But from a prestige factor, you look at what's left of the Big 12, 
you'd probably say Kansas is one of the more appealing programs because of the basketball program. Uh, does basketball matter at all when it, when it comes but to dollars and cents here? With dollars and cents, basketball is about one-fifth, right? You're doing those conference deals into about 80% football, 20% basketball, with a possible exception of the ACC, where maybe it's more 65-35. So the ACC will be fine. Oddly enough, they wouldn't be a bad home for Kansas, though geographically it's crazy. Though it does bring in another state for the for the conference network, and that has to be kept in mind. Why does that matter? Because people point out with Oklahoma that that's a big deal. Because if you add a college from a state you're already in, you don't get any more distributor fees, right? They add Texas. If I get Texas A&M, there's no new money from the state of Texas. They add Oklahoma. Oklahoma, uh, they now have to pay a distribution fee in Oklahoma. If the ACC added Kansas, you'd have to add Kansas. And by the way, even with r fairly small populations, it's still a lot of money uh, for those networks, which all are above a dollar. So it's a dollar for every good citizen of the state who has a pay TV sub, which is declining, but still a lot of people. Uh, the other place for Kansas, of course, is to go to um, Big Ten, and it would make no difference for their football. Uh, they would lose the same amount of games they lose now. <laughs> the harder part, too, is the schools can't kick anybody out, right? Now, that would be the ultimate sort of difficulty, which is, G is, I, I'm not even going to say names. You, no, I'll can let we, kick, can we kick out, uh, are you talking about like in the SEC? You're talking about, can we? Kick Vanderbilt? Out can we oh, kick no, out Vanderbilt's Vanderbilt? bringing up that Vandy. GPA by itself. Uh, That's why Vandy is there. I don't know. Clark, we also. They, they are. Something. I had a son who went to Vanderbilt. I must tell you, it was not always pleasant to look into the Vanderbilt stadium and see it full of Alabama fans. But what's to keep, what is legitimately to keep the SEC from saying, you know what, get out of here, Vanderbilt. We want Ohio it's, State. <laughs> it's a, Nothing. It's a good question. <laughs> they should do it. I think there may be some <laughs> governance things. I'm not sure they could do it without everybody agreeing the school's agreeing. It's an interesting phenomenon, which I don't think has ever happened. I, I also don't, don't think that schools can, or conferences can recruit schools to join them. I think the schools have to initiate the move because that's kind of what's happening with the Texas and Oklahoma thing right now. The SEC can't admit. Yeah, but everyone's we, noticing that this is what's the play here. Right, like, no, I understand. It, but but if you're Texas A&M and, and the SEC is violating your agreement and going out and recruiting your in-state rival, then you're going to have a problem yeah. with that. But the, the SEC can kind of None play of dumb that and would say, happen in the dirtiness they can kind of, of play dumb and be like, ah, Texas reached out to us and it makes sense, so here, yeah. here we well, are. I doubt that Texas A&M has an agreement that they can't bring in another Texas school. This is a lot like dating in high school, right? It's not clear who asks whom when the prom comes around. Uh, it, you know, usually there's a way for somebody to make sure that Evelyn knows that uh, Billy or Jane wants to take him or her to the prom. Somehow they figure it out. So uh, this, I don't think uh, Texas had to be asked or Texas had to ask. What are the money issues that you think the audience would find interesting here? You have, you know, you have a knowledge, a working knowledge that we don't have here about the, the money that's involved here and what this play will mean for 10 years from now. Well, it just means that the bigger schools are going to get bigger. It's going to be harder to intrude into the club. Somebody yesterday said on the air, there's 15 to 20 schools that overwhelmingly uh, dominate college football. It's not even that many, right? If you look at the four who get into the playoffs, it's Clemson, it's Alabama, it's and Notre LSU, Dame, yeah. Ohio it's, State. It, it, Notre Dame has to be taken to the slaughter. I know we've got a fan here. Has to be taken to the slaughter every now and they then. They covered, but yeah. They're they're one of the most <laughs> they're they're one of the most interesting players here because they do have the choice. They value and it's been great for them, their independence. But they do have to be careful that it's not musical chairs and that everybody doesn't get into a 16-team conference and they're the last one standing. And the ACC, on the other hand, has to worry not to give away the 15th and 16th spot uh, in case Notre Dame became available. It was, it was one of the benefits of COVID for them is suddenly mm -hmm. Notre Dame was an ACC school for a year. And the TV partners definitely benefited from that, considering how they gamed the system so Notre Dame could find their way into that championship game. I'm going to ask you a question, and please don't laugh at me, because you mentioned the ACC. 
Yeah, but you yeah, had Clemson at home. Back they were quarter, undefeated. Back. They're oh, doing okay. fine. So were you. Jeez. Uh, so <laughs> how much does academics matter? Because with the ACC, we've, we've read in the past that West Virginia would actually make a lot of sense for them, but they don't meet the academic standard. And this would be a hurdle in maybe making an overture to a UCF, which is actually a really attractive school, not just because their football program has gained notoriety, but they have the biggest alumni base in Florida, it, mm-hmm. it's a diamond in the middle of the state right now to be had, but their academic standards aren't ACC standard. It's, it's, it's interesting, Mike. I mean, the it matters to some schools, right? doesn't matter to other schools. Uh, Duke and Wake Forest and North Carolina and Virginia are going to want to have that. That was why they, they had a problem with West Virginia last time and uh, didn't want to take them in the Big Ten. You've got Michigan and Ohio State, and they really care. I forget what their um, the, – there's a standard for schools that are in a certain association that the Big Ten is very proud of and has never taken anybody who wasn't in that. Oklahoma, Whatever it is, Oklahoma State's not in. Um, and I don't think Baylor's in. So they have a problem. And on the West Coast, Berkeley cares. And, is a, you know, UCLA cares and USC Stanford, cares. Stanford, yeah. Uh, Stanford cares. Can, can the money get to a place where they stop caring? Uh, apparently so. Yes, I do believe in almost all matters of the heart, soul, mind. M- enough money can tend to overcome overcome uh, an issue. So is Clemson better off in the ACC? I want every team now moving to the SEC, or should they consider a move to the SEC? Clemson should be very happy to be in the ACC. They got an easier path to a football championship, which is what they care about every year. Would do nothing for the SEC because they already have a South Carolina school. Right Now, interesting enough, a North Carolina school would be very valuable to the SEC because the North Carolina is the ninth largest state in the country uh, in terms of population. Little known fact from a Tar Heel. You want your but, Tar Heels? No, I do not want. Car- no, no, I do not want. <laughs> they can go. They no, can go. No, uh, uh, it, it would make the uh, the basketball would become easier. But no, you wouldn't want to not. You, you have to be in the same conference as Duke because you got to play them in basketball. What's this all going to look like in ten years? Um, it's gonna it's gonna be super conferences, and it's going to be more and more concentration at the top. There is one interesting thing, just to create a little fun here which is, in fact, the basketball tournament is an interesting thing, too. If you created four 16-team super conferences, the basketball conferences play in the NCAA tournament by choice. There is nothing that would prevent a breakaway basketball tournament. Oh, wow. I think there's also some people who think that this could, this four super conference thing in college football could mean that they, uh, the college football programs break away from the NCAA as well and kind of form a, a minor league college football program, I guess, with college affiliations. I think that's right, Jessica, and that was why I was sort of suggesting that a one way to gin up a whole bunch more money is, gee, we're going to have a new basketball tournament, and if 64 teams works naturally that all 64 teams could come into the tournament. One would play 64 so all of the super conference teams would make the tournament and the current tournament with some independents and other conferences would, would fall be, apart, would be, would, would be irrelevant. It, it would become the, what's, what's the second tournament? The, the NIT. 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 Yeah. NIT. Could, the schools just do this at any time. Could all the Florida schools just band together and be like, we're going to make a Florida conference. Imagine the TV deal we'd mm, get that way. No, I don't I mean, I think that the, the schools have binding agreements that are tied to the TV agreements. So if the SEC agreements through 36 or 35, 35 and the ACC agreements through 36, if they, they cannot leave without negotiating an exit, which is one reason that Oklahoma and Texas are moving now is the Big 12 contract is coming up. So it's within the amount of money they can negotiate that they're going to negotiate an exit from the Big 12. So it'll probably happen earlier than 20. Five or twenty-six. But do any of the schools have a binding agreement with the NCAA as the governing body who gets to give them the rules? But they don't obviously have anything to do with the college football playoff as it is right now. I do not think. I think that the the uh, NCAA oversight uh, does not have anything that binds the schools to actually do it. 
if they don't want to. Just to be clear then, John, the reason that this is happening is because the SEC will split up more money, and this will mean for Texas and Oklahoma in the short term, as soon as they join, somewhere between 20 to $40 million a year, more than they're getting from their conference now. That's there, there's no whatever second place on the reason for doing this is a distant second. That's yeah, the reason. That's correct. I mean, remember the one when uh, Maryland actually exposed the numbers, right? The president of Maryland, whose name was Wallace something, I forget what, who previously been a president of the Big Ten school, decided to join the Big Ten, and he just said his money. In X number of years, we're going to be getting 45. I think they're actually getting 55 now. We're currently getting 25 with that $20 million. We can make a great... Uh, Great new stadium. I'm not sure that's happened. And uh, we'll become a football power. I'm not sure that's happened easier either. But it's just the pressure. It's the pressure to keep up with the with the big schools. Is name, image, and license and likeness going to be something that creates more parity or less parity? I think like all instances, when things happen, there are a few people who think, oh, my gosh, this will be great for the little guy. It's never good for the little guy. It'll be good for the big guys. One of the reasons, I suspect it's a minor reason, but Texas and Oklahoma are going to have to keep up. There's an Alabama quarterback who's getting a million dollars already to play for Alabama. You're going to get more money in the SEC because they care more about it. Your ratings are higher. With the teams you play, the, the, the athletes are going to get more money. So the image, image and likeness just drive people back again to Clemson, Alabama, Texas, Oklahoma, et cetera, et cetera. What about the medium to tall guy? Not so much the little guy. Someone that's right around 5'11". Would have gotten to 6 if it were not for a flag in the Fiesta Bowl. Uh-huh. Like me. Uh-huh. <laughs> Wait, first of all, there is no such thing as a 5'11 man. Just be real. Uh, there's a, After about 5'9", everybody's 6. <laughs> right? You start at 6. I'm 6'2 six, and 5'8". I think I'm shorter than Mike. But... But, well, but uh, Mike is living that lie no, with his Miami program. No, no, no it's believes, not true. I believe Mike yeah. tells the truth. <laughs> yeah. But I do see a lot of guys who are 6'4 who are yeah. shorter than I am. Yeah, I don't Miami, know what the phenomenon that is. Miami didn't get to 6, but if there's ever an argument for 5'12", it's <laughs> fes <laughs> Are we going to see UCF ever Never. ever in this playoff? <laughs> is UCF ever going to get in this game? I, th- I think it's pretty hard, right? It's uh it's like a it's these guys these things are like weird college clubs, you know, skull and bones. You don't qual- you know, getting in uh is a hard thing. I don't think any, any of these schools want to see another superpower. They don't want to be in it, Dan. They don't want they like occupying their little piece of real estate is oh if we played we would have we would have whooped you. Right. Everyone's so unfair to us. A good, good, Yet good and look anytime it comes to scheduling a game, they're like, okay, home home and away. Home home and away. <laughs> Please stop crucifying no, right, UCF. No, he's right. I, okay. They fine. prefer the illusion of hey, That's maybe fine. they could win it's this. It's the game. only space for them based on the way they've just been boxed out by the superpowers, all kind of getting together and forming uh, a monopoly. Uh, unfortunately, the ACC has Miami and Florida State, and uh, SEC has University of Florida. Could we see a playoff where every team is from the SEC? I don't think you could. Oh. No. But uh, you will see a disproportionate number of teams, which, again, you guys talked about yesterday. It, this does open up the chance that a three-loss team can make it, right, if you get to 12. Yes. And, the, and these things, again, are, are intertwined. So you're going to see the playoff happen sooner rather than later with more teams. Is this all the instigation of ESPN? Is this all your fault? <laughs> um. I, I'd like to take the fifth. Do I have do I have uh, do I have uh, rights? I don't know whether my rights apply here on the uh, on freedom. Just say you got hacked, John. Okay, say I got hacked. Yeah. Okay, taking the fifth is always a great way to end the segment. <laughs> the new Greg Cody Show podcast talks Ted Lasso with show writer and creative force Bill Lawrence. Greg Cody is only here joining us because he wants everyone to know that. He spends four hours with us here every week coughing and wheezing, and all of a sudden, whenever he hears the word flee, just shouting, 
red hot chili peppers because he's just here to shout whatever thought that he has. That's right. At whatever time that he has it. What do you want to tell people about the new Greg Cody show? I was thinking the same thing though when Greg said it. I mean, I was. I mean, it's the first thing you, you think of when you right? when you hear Flea. Of yeah. course. Who else is named Flea? The new Greg Cody show podcast. What do you want us to know? Well, that's a a good one. Uh, an extra good one. Bill Bill Lawrence was fantastic. He was uh, very funny. Um, spoke about Ted Lasso in a very thoughtful way, and uh, I'd love people to to listen to it. Amin Al Hassan is headed to Milwaukee. He is taking Tony with him, and I want to get some details here because Amin just realized. Congrats, Tony, from Lake Tahoe to Milwaukee. <laughs> What's up and up? I thought that it was funny that Amin just noticed uh, that it was going to be hard to get on radio stations in Milwaukee to publicize this event because there's been some Aaron Rodgers news that has consumed <laughs> no everybody. One cares about the Bucks anymore. And all of a sudden he finds himself in a place where he's heading to a bar that's actually called, and Greg Cody will love this, McGillicuddy's. Yeah, <laughs> baby. <laughs> he is All headed. Right. He is headed to a bar, and I'm not sure anyone will be there. Tony, give us all the details we need so that people listening to this in Milwaukee get there. I mean, Bobby Portis was on with us yesterday. He's in Arkansas already. <laughs> Dan, the uh, details are sparing, as you can probably imagine. They're not many details tomorrow. to bring. Yeah, it's tomorrow, Billy. But again, we are fly by the seat of our pants kind of guys. I mean, and I. That's why he chose me to uh to go with him to milwaukee <laughs> and we are going to be at McGill uh, mcgillicuddy's pub wherever that may be in milwaukee and i'm hoping at least three to five people show up to dunk a mean that would be great billy why are you uh why are you holding your head in your hands it, it just it's, it's tomorrow it seems like maybe some of the details should be <laughs> i just this gave isn't you all my the details thing. billy i just gave you all the details we're going to be at mcgillicuddy's pub i mean it's going to be at a dunk tank what time, time? central yeah. oh <laughs> It's central yeah. over there. Are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I believe so. What? Yeah, they are. They are. What is funnier? Seventy like percent sure. What's funnier for content for our show? If we sent two Metal Arc Media employees out there, and there are three total people there. Or if there's a giant crowd waiting to dunk Amin El Hassan, which one's the funnier content? We need this to produce something. We're clearly spending money on it. We're sending out correspondence. I hope you don't want it to produce anything on air because it opens at 4 p.m. <laughs> well, we're not on air tomorrow, so we is that are... 3 p.m. Central? What... <laughs> I don't know, man. What... It's it's 10:42 in Milwaukee right now as we're taping this. Okay, it's a good job. Thank, Thank you, Mr. God's excellent man. You can but subtract my, my one. 43. I mean, it's weird. Did you really try to show off the back time an hour? It's a, well, it's a really it's technically 61 minutes. It's odd. This <laughs> is what you are trying to do around here, showing off. Look, I, Mr. God's. What time is it in California right? Right now, uh, huh. <laughs> Tony, any other details that you can give us? Anything I didn't know else? The Gillicuddy's opened at four. That's a problem because my flight out's at six. So we're going to have a real tight window with oh, the mean no. getting dunked. Oh, Hopefully, those geez. three people show up and we can just get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> Billy now has knocked his cap off his head to hold his head in his hands because he's mortified by the general lack of planning he has to around the airport here. at four for a six o'clock <laughs> oh, flight. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we will see what happens with this. Hopefully it'll birth some content that you will be able to get on YouTube or on our social feeds or Thursday, or maybe it's just metal arc wasting a bunch of money and making everybody sad. There is a story that Amin was trying to get my attention on last week and we never got to it. What are you laughing about now, Billy? Because this is delicate subject matter I'm headed into, but I want to get all the laughs off of the plate here so that I could get into the delicate subject matter. Because Woody just turned to Tony and goes, are you actually concerned now about four o'clock? And he goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just learned that this opens at four o'clock and i mean just learned that he can't publicize it in milwaukee because aaron Rodgers reported okay if it's a disaster it's a disaster we will do what we can with it but speaking of disasters this story that amin has been trying to get my attention now on is something that is in full bloom at the olympics because i can't believe that what I'm reading is so. I would have thought that this was something from The Onion. So I'm just going to read it, Stugatz, because it seems crazy. Ten days after fencer Alan Hadzik secured a spot as an alternate on the U.S. Olympic team, a group of women took their concerns about him straight to the top. 
The six women fencers, including two Olympic athletes, wrote to the Olympic Committee that Hadzik should not be allowed to represent the U.S. because he was under investigation for at least three accusations of sexual misconduct reported to the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, the nonprofit agency responsible for protecting athletes from abuse. Acknowledging the severity of the allegations facing Hadzik, USA Fencing, the athletic federation in charge of selecting the country's Olympic competitors, created a safety plan to keep him away from women and out of the Olympic village. He flew in on a separate plane from his teammates, is staying at a hotel 30 minutes away from the other athletes, and won't be allowed to practice alongside women teammates. After he appealed those conditions, the entire roster of Team USA fencers signed a letter demanding the restrictions stay in place. To many of his teammates, he shouldn't be representing the country at all. Quote, we are pissed off that this is even a thing we have to deal with. An Olympic fencer who filed a complaint against Hadzik alleging predatory behavior told BuzzFeed News from Tokyo. He's been protected again and again. How does this happen? How can it be possible that a fencing alternate is worth all of these liberties and rule changes just for him? How can someone how forget can about I alternate? If he if he was the greatest fencer in the history of fencing, he should not be representing a country. He should not be allowed. Um, he should not be allowed at the Olympic Games. I mean, I'm with you. It's it's very it's perplexing how this happens. How does this it, how does a team tell you we can't have this guy on representing our country on our team and the reaction to that is to protect him is to protect his spot on the team is to make so many concessions that the way that you protect the women is by making all sorts of different rules that make it so that he can be on the team. The reason that I said an alternate is because I'd understand compromised principles at the height of sports where people are always making these decisions in, in the business of sports. They're, you know, they're throwing away their principles and their moralities all the time because so-and-so is so great that we can't do without him. But how do you arrive in a place where on fencing, fencing, with an alternate, you're changing all the rules when the people are telling you that are on the team, get him away from us. A lot of people also are making the parallel that Shikari Richardson was not allowed to go to Tokyo because she failed a drug test. And in the meantime, you know, drug uh, marijuana test, which we obviously is legal in a lot of places in the United States and most people don't consider a very big deal anymore. And in the meantime, this person is given all of these special circumstances just so he can go despite these accusations. And in the BuzzFeed news story, there's also some accusations of him having violent behavior while he's drinking. There's an accusation that he kicked a, an unhoused person on the street and just walked past someone and kicked them once. Um, it's pretty damning stuff. And the, the ability for the sport to make all of these concessions for him while the rules are just not equal for everyone is is kind of glaring in this case i don't even know if we had someone on from usa fencing how it is that given the details that i'm reading i don't even know how you make the argument on behalf of allowing this person to get a totally different set of rules because he's so important to what you're doing that you have to offend everybody on your team in order to do it they're trying to limit the public shaming, too, because they posted a photo of him on social media and limited the, the comments uh, after fences were actually having to go in the comments trying to highlight that this person being there is beyond problematic. Doesn't the head of U.S. fencing have to lose his or her job over this? I mean, it's a... It's only it, it's not does a bigger it, scandal it, only it, because it's fencing. No, Dan, it, you do he, question the people making these uh, these decisions. I mean, come on. Doesn't he have to lose his job over yes. this? He, yes, yes, the fencing. Yes, 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 that goes without saying. But the person that allowed this fencer to be at the Olympic Games representing our country, uh, despite hearing all the negative things from from teammates who would know more than they would know. I mean, Dan, that's concerning that people are in that position making those types of decisions. It is. From what I understand, USA Fencing did disqualify him, but then he went to arbitration and the arbitra arbitrator um, 
reinstated him. He won his case in arbitration. So. Okay, so they went through some sort of process, and then they're legally bound somehow so that they don't get lawsuits? Okay, then then, then at least you're giving me some information that presents another side of this argument because the details that I have so far don't help me at all to understand that if they're legally bound somehow because now they're going to get lawsuits keeping somebody off of a team that would better explain why you would go to these lengths to make any sort of concessions for anybody never mind an alternate and the, the buzzfeed news story goes into some detail about safe sport which is this governing body that was created um i believe as a result of the larry nasser uh trial that is now in charge of um governing cases of sexual misconduct and sexual abuse within sports in America. So I believe they are the ones who are being called into question for the way that they are handling this case. I should have discussed this before it all started. Amin was trying to bring it to my attention. Amin uh, is in Milwaukee. He's headed to Milwaukee. The only reason I bring it up is because, Roy, you guys were laughing about something during difficult subject matter. I'm assuming something else has fallen apart regarding this trip to Milwaukee and Amin and Tony? Uh, no, we were laughing about something that happened during Big Suey, uh, during the uh, song discussion. Um, in a reply I made to Mike, um, I was talking about a song two by Blur, and then I mentioned one of the lyrics. He said that, uh, oh, nobody knows the lyrics of that song. I said, but he has head shape. And that's what Chris and I were laughing about. So you were laughing at yourself while we were handling that subject matter, just listening to something funny you did a few hours ago. Glad while you didn't go to him, though. Yeah, 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 I'm very happy. I'm I very wish happy I hadn't gone that. to him, but we're on video, and as we're talking about this subject matter, you see Roy roaring I with laughter. That. I noticed that. As, as we're it was on, jarring. As, I saw we're, it. We're, on, we're on YouTube, and Roy is roaring with laughter, and so I felt like it needed an explanation of some sort. It did I didn't. Okay. Well, I wish we hadn't gotten it. I wish you'd just been out there roaring with laughter. I can't even look at him segment. right now. <laughs> it's just so it just made something up. I was <laughs> made so uncomfortable by all of that. I, I, he went to me. I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. I guess that's the gamble we took, Roy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We could have made something up out. about Tony's flight or a yeah. mean. I, I'd lie, yes. Well, he's not used to guys. No, I'm not used to guys. So I don't really lie. That's not my thing. But in that spot, sure Dan, thing. Dan needed a lie. <laughs> I, I needed someone to not be laughing during the sensitive, offensive subject matter. <laughs> I've never seen Roy so happy. <laughs> We're talking about a sexual predator in fencing, and Roy's going. <laughs> Find me a moment where you needed a lie. <laughs> I, mean, I wasn't there for you. <laughs> Production. I hope that they air all of that because if you're not familiar with her work, she writes about people who happen to play sports, but she's interested in telling human stories. And her new book, Giannis, The Improbable Rise of an NBA MVP, is out August 6th. Thank you for joining us. What would you say were the things that you learned that you did not know that you found most interesting about a guy that I don't feel like we know very well. I feel like we've just got some superficial glances about him being humble and being some of the things that people like about athletes, but you've got the entire biography, the entire journey. Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me. Um, I feel like the entire childhood section is stuff that I didn't know, you know, and that was the goal for me. It was like, how can I bridge the gap between sold trinkets on the street and becomes an NBA MVP. We really don't know too much in between. Where did he sell trinkets? How did he sell trinkets? You know, who bought it? What kind of food would they eat? Like there were just thousands of questions that I had. And what I found was that, yes, there are feel good elements that a lot of people have picked up. You know, it's called a fairy tale, but there are also people that were not kind to him at all. There was so much racism that he dealt with and being undocumented as a black child of migrants was very, very hard. Um, and I think that gets swept under the rug with Giannis because people love to talk about his ascension. Um, and then finally, just there was joy. You know, a lot of times us in media, we write about the trauma of athletes and we don't talk about the, the good times and the happy times that they had, but he had a lot of joy because for him, his childhood was normal. You know, it wasn't this sob story all of the time he had a lot of fun so it was really interesting for me to see that childhood part of his life
What are the things that you say from his childhood are most responsible for shaping who he is as an adult? I think, first of all, it was observing. Giannis is a very intellectual and curious person and it's because he would always watch what his parents did. So when his mom would work 14 hour days and come home tired, but have this giant smile on her face, he could intuit that she was not happy, but she was trying to be so that he would have happy memories. And she would force herself to wash, for example, their socks. They each only had one pair. And he watches that and he's like, that is work ethic. You know, nobody has to tell him work hard. He learns it from watching. Um, he learns it from seeing that his dad is sitting there smiling, even though he's hungry and hasn't eaten in two days because his dad wants to, you know, give the portion to Giannis and his brothers. And then I think finally, Giannis is 13 years old, feeling like the man of his brothers. He is watching where his younger brothers go and always having to be careful and, you know, don't go there or, you know, oh, you can have my food. He, he almost has to mature so much more quickly than other, other boys. What were the hard parts about the transition to America? That was one of the most interesting things I found. So I think if you all remember in 2013 to 14, when he's a rookie, everyone's falling in love with Giannis, right? He's drinking smoothies. We're all like, wow, who is this adorable Greek kid? He was deeply, deeply lonely. And Alex, the youngest brother, was telling me that Giannis almost left the NBA. He was telling Alex and the family, like, if you guys can't come here to America, I'm coming home. So for a backstory, Giannis and his brother Thanasis got citizenship at the last minute by the Greek government, because unlike in America, Greece doesn't give you birthright citizenship, even if you're born there. So once the Greek government saw that Giannis was about to go to the NBA, they gave him his papers, but they didn't give it to his mom. They didn't give it to his dad and they didn't give it to the younger brothers. So they got their visas denied two times. I found in my reporting while Giannis made it to the NBA. And it was doubtful whether they were going to be able to move to America. And Giannis is somebody that's so used to sleeping side by side with his brothers, you know, being around his family every second. And without them, he just felt lost. You know, he was trying to do well on the court. Milwaukee was terrible. They won 15 games that year. But he was just so, so lonely without his family. Why is he so hard on himself? He's so hard on himself because he knows the the chances that people get are so slim. There was one moment uh, where he and his brothers had a chance to move up to a better division in Greece because they were in the lowest division, which is called A2. But at the end of the year, if you win your last game, you can leapfrog to the top one. And had they leapfrogged, they would have gotten money. They would have gotten shoes. They would have, it would have changed their family's life. And um, they lost. And so it's moments like that where they're all sitting together after this game and just crying, watching opportunity slip from their fingers. And they realize that the chances that people get do not come often. And when they come, you have to, you have to get them or else you never know when they'll come again. So Giannis grew up with this sense of being so hard on himself, dealing with factors that he can't control. Um, and there's also a burning desire in him to be great. He has always wanted to be great. Like he comes to America, Milwaukee, doesn't even know how to weightlift, but he wants to become the best weightlifter on the Milwaukee Bucks. So imagine learning to bench press for the first time and you're already thinking about how can I outdo people? And then when you don't outdo people and you're a scrub and you're scrawny and you are not the best, you are actually the worst on the team, that motivates him and he's tough on himself. Uh, one of my favorite things I'll just say to end here on this answer is that I learned that he's so hard on himself that he would cry openly growing up in Greece. So there, boys are socialized differently. You don't have to hold in your emotions like we do in America. And his coaches became used to it. Oh, Giannis is upset with his performance. He's crying on the bench. So when he comes to Milwaukee, there are moments where Larry Drew, the coach, and Robert Hackett, the strength coach, told me they would watch him tear up when he wasn't doing well. And they had to tell him, like, you can't cry in the NBA. So I think Giannis just has a different level of emotional intelligence and sensitivity that really drives him. That desire to be great, where did that come from? You know, I think some of it's innate. Some of it is from his dad. So his dad was Charles, is a former soccer player. And Charles would always say, you know, you must give 
everything when you're playing. And they were just playing pickup soccer. You know, Charles is 40 something. They're beating all the, the people in Sapolia. But there was a sense that even if you're having fun, you want to work your hardest and try to be the best. And so he's just always had that. How cautious was he about spending once he got to money? Oh, my God. That was one of the biggest things I found. Giannis is so hesitant. So, you know, as a child, he's so used to suppressing his wants because he knows that the only thing that matters are needs. And as a child, he wanted a PlayStation so badly and they just couldn't get it. So by the time he gets to Milwaukee and he has money, he sees one and he is so interested in buying it. He does it on whim. And then he berates himself for being so frivolous. You know, how can you do this when people back home are suffering? How can you do this? And he returns it the next morning. I mean, he was the only player I found in my reporting that didn't have direct deposit because he needed to feel the money in his hands. He wouldn't spend a dime. He saved everything for his family to come over. His home was almost like the preparation home. We're going to have all the per diems over here for my family once they come. I'm not even going to mess up this bed. I'm going to keep it immaculate for them. Like he just, he was so hesitant. And you know what? It continued on even when he became a multimillionaire. I think the first time he bought first class seats was like 2016. How close in your reporting did you get to his decision making on whether to stay in Milwaukee or leave? You know, not directly to him because at that point, COVID had hit and all my in person stuff. Um, fizzled. But I was hearing a lot about like his mom, Veronica, and knowing that, you know, she really loves staying. But I was kind of hearing both things, you know, I kind of thought it could go both ways. Like it is entirely possible that he could leave. Like some days he seems like he's in it and he wants to stay. And other days it's like, I don't know. But for me, the thing that stood out from the reporting that I did prior to that summer, um, when I did the story uh, for Bleacher Report, which this came out of, um, where I spent the day with them, I was just amazed how rooted they were in Milwaukee, how much they saw it as home. Because, you know, they've moved so much um, geographically. Um, like Alex, the youngest brother, like he made a life there. He, he had friends there. They really loved Milwaukee. So I could kind of have seen it going either way. You say that you had a million questions about how he grew up and where did he sell trinkets and what trinkets was he selling? What are the reported details that uh, stayed with you the most. You mentioned owning one pair of socks, the things that mm -hmm. you didn't know that you discovered that you found most detail rich were. Yeah. So they would go to upscale beaches that were far away. Uh, one of them is called Alimos beach. And you would think like in your mind that this is a negative experience. They're selling off the side of the street, but actually the boys love going to the beach because they could go in the water and have fun. And for a moment, they would be distracted from all of the painful things going on. And they were just learning to swim and laughing and having fun. And so they would be gone for two weeks at a time at these upscale beaches. And they had to be so creative with what they sold. They would find like a knockoff Louis Vuitton purse and then sell it. They would just find little tiny things like that. And, and also I found that it was risky to sell because they didn't have a permit. So the market is called the Laiki and it was on Wednesdays. And they could get in trouble for being there because they did not have one of those stands or a permit like most people because they were undocumented. So just finding out that, you know, Thanasis would brag to people like, I can run really fast if the, if the cops find us or whatever, I can, I can get away. Um, you know, just details like that. And um, details like one anecdote really stood out. Giannis didn't really want to let his teammates know how much they were suffering or didn't have. And so they didn't really know the extent of their suffering until Giannis fainted one practice um, because he hadn't eaten anything all day. And talking to the coaches and teammates who just felt so bad, like, you know, we didn't know. Um, we had no idea because he wasn't one to be like, can you help me? You know, he wanted to try to handle it on his own. Um, you know, there were just so many anecdotes like that. And for example, one teammate who's a good friend of Giannis to this day, his name is Christos Salustros, um, he would give the brothers money to get a Gatorade or something at the market. And the little brothers, uh, Kostas and Alex, were so touched by this, they insisted on bringing back change and the receipt. And the friend was like, no, you don't worry about it. But they felt so bad that, that people were giving to them. And, and so, you know, you just saw the kindness of so many people. 
knowing him the way you know him now, I'm wondering, did anything about his emotional outburst, how talkative he was, how happy he was after winning the title, did any of that surprise you? It didn't surprise me. In fact, when I saw him sitting and crying, I thought of the 12 year old who would cry openly. I thought of the 18 year old who would cry on a bench in Milwaukee because he was dissatisfied with his performance. I thought it was such a beautiful display of emotion that we don't always see from our modern day superstars. And it just reminded me how different Giannis is wired and how um, unique he is in so many ways. Um, And I know that winning, it wasn't just look at all that I personally have overcome. It was look at all of Milwaukee has overcome. You know, a big part of the book was charting the history of the Bucks and how from its inception, people were like, basketball can't work in Milwaukee. You have this like decades old wound of Kareem leaving and Giannis like heals this wound by staying. And if he doesn't stay, the franchise doesn't stay. And so I, I saw the tears and I just, all these, I was making all these connections between all these crazy things that have happened all because of this guy. You mentioned the smoothies. I remember the way I was introduced to him was early in his career, somebody filmed him running to <laughs> either the game or practice where he was just, where I don't even know, running miles to where it is that he, <laughs> he wasn't driving a car. He was just running there. The anecdote is actually that he was running to a Western. No, so he went to a Western Union to send all the money he had to home to Greece. And he realized he put all of his money into the Western Union <laughs> and didn't have money for a, for a cab home. So he just started running. Yes. And I talked to the woman who picked him up that day. Her name is Jane Gallup longtime Bucks fan. Uh, the Bucks were like the one thing she had in common with her son. And she sees this tall guy running. She's like, why do I know him? You know, why does he look familiar? And then she's like, oh shit, it's Giannis. And then just instinctually her Midwestern maternal self is like, should we like ask him if he needs help? And then they pull down the window and Giannis is like, can you take me to the Bradley Center? And then like, ah. he thinks they're a taxi. You know what I mean? And Jane is like, oh yeah, sure. So I forgot what kind of, I forgot the details, the details in the book, but it's a, I might, might've been a Honda fit, a very like petite car. And so Yana stuffs his like gangly self in the back seat. He's just looking nervous. His knees are up to his nose. You know, and this is the weirdest situation. Jane is like, I don't understand why he has a windbreaker. We're in Milwaukee. She's debating if she should take him to a Walmart to buy him a coat. <laughs> Yana is just sitting back there, like quiet. It's the most awkward car ride ever. But afterward, you know, he gets out and he's like, thank you very much. I really, really appreciate it. And he gives his autograph in, in Greek and English. And then John Hammond, the Bucks GM, is like, Giannis, don't ever get in the car with strangers. You know, it's just this adorable, <laughs> like a paternal thing, you know, but that's how it was back back then with Giannis. They were, they were looking after him like he was their son. What are the other details from the cultural transition, the isolation and the stuff that, uh, the details that stuck out to you about when you're talking about he almost left the NBA, I did not yeah. know that. Yeah, yeah. So um, first of all, the the sense of, of physically being so lonely. So one of my favorite scenes in the book is he becomes really close to this video coordinator for the Bucks named Ross Geiger. And it's really late after the game. And the two of them became besties. They would always go to Chili's because Chili's had you know, late night specials and Giannis liked how cheap it was, of course, or they would go to Cheesecake Factory because Giannis became obsessed with burgers and milkshakes. Like he could not get over this concept of a milkshake, not quite ice cream, not quite smoothie, you know, what a combination. And they get back to um, Giannis's apartment and Ross is like, hey, buddy, I got to go. We got practice early. I got to break down this film. And um, Giannis is like so vulnerable in this moment. He's like, um, can you like stay the night, you know? And it was just so like, my heart is just, you know, it's just so tender because it's like, he was so alone and he just needed somebody to be there. Um, and then Ross stays and Ross realizes he gets the trust of Giannis because Giannis doesn't trust people because he grows up being undocumented, not knowing who could hurt them or take his parents away. And the other anecdote that really stood out to me might be my favorite one in the book that I found is that because he was so distrustful, he um, wanted a Buck staffer present when he got his cable installed. And because he didn't know, like, who is this guy coming to my apartment? A Bucks guy is there. It goes on a really long time, like nine to four. 
And the buck staffer is hungry. So he goes into Giannis's kitchen and he takes three Oreos. He sees a little Oreo jar. Doesn't think anything of it. He just eats it, whatever. The next day at practice, Giannis is like kind of mad. He goes up to the staffer. He's like, did you eat my Oreos? And then the staffer's like, uh, uh, what do you mean? You know? And then Giannis is like, well, I noticed three were missing. And the, the staffer is just stunned because first of all, like who does that? Who counts their Oreos? But then it all makes sense to him. Of course he counts his Oreos. This is a person that is so used to being without he always has to know how much he has. And so it's just moments like that where people really saw that he was dealing with so much more than trying to be a good basketball player. He was really trying to reconcile all of his childhood trauma and trying to adapt, but not being able to let go of these impulses. The name of the book, Giannis, The Improbable Rise of an NBA MVP is out August 10th. Thank you for the insight. I did not know a good deal of that stuff. Appreciate you sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.